Good afternoon, or should I say good morning. Um, my name is uh, Robert Francis, uh, and I'm a professor emeritus of economics and international studies here at uh, Shoreline. Uh, I also um, ended up my career uh, as both Dean of uh, Social Sciences, uh, Equity and Social Justice in the library, uh, and then moved on to be the Vice President of Academic and Student Affairs. I will tell you though, the joy of my uh, 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 career uh, is working with students. Uh, and I still remember all of my students. I like that many of my students are still engaged uh, in uh, how they are changing the world. Uh, students uh, in Hong Kong, in Beijing, uh, in Australia, I, I will be attending actually a wedding uh, in Amalfi, Italy uh, of a former student. Uh, so that kind of connection is great. Uh, and it's, an, I absolutely jumped at the chance to be able to introduce another Shoreline student who I uh, had the privilege of working with and learning from, uh, and that's Simon Walker, uh, our speaker today. Uh, Simon Walker, I uh, is uh, the president uh, of uh, Gen R. I became president in 19, oops, 2015. <laughs> uh, I'm dating myself here. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that amazes me as I looked at the website uh, is how this group represents the values uh, of this college uh, and this community. Uh, and I will tell you from my old experience as a guy who has lived through uh, generation after generation being trashed by older generation, Gen R is exactly what this generation is about. Uh, getting involved, making a difference, making uh, something uh, of the world a better place. Uh, so I really enjoyed your Gen R piece. Uh, they are um, uh, connected with uh, the International Rescue Committee. I'm, uh, I'm really uh, interested in hearing more about that from Simon. Uh, Simon graduated uh, in uh, 2012 uh, here at Shoreline. While he was at Shoreline, I have all these wonderful notes that I have to refer to here. While he was at Shoreline, uh, he was president uh, of our political economics club, Whoop and Dis, Worldly Philosophers and Dismal, uh, Dismal Scientist Society. Uh, he was the recipient of Student of the Year, Leader of the Year Award. Uh, he earned a Gilman Scholarship uh, for a study abroad uh, process. Uh, he was uh, a graduate from our honors program. I still remember him working feverishly in FOSS building on his pre honors presentation. Uh, he was editor of our student newspaper, uh, and uh, he was uh, a, a left back uh, at the Shoreline soccer team. Uh, so uh, kudos to you. Uh, and also, uh, Simon then moved on to uh, a small school down the road, University of Washington, uh, and uh, well, there he graduated in 2015 uh, from the Jackson School of International Studies. Uh, he, uh, there he was the recipient of the Jackson Leadership Award, very impressive, uh, and also was editor-in-chief of the Jackson uh, School Journal, uh, undergraduate journal. Uh, for international studies. Uh, uh, currently, uh, uh, Simon is uh, working war for ooh, Loft. Loft 9. Uh, and uh, which is consulting uh, with Microsoft on uh, uh, Microsoft uh, 3. Office 365. What? Office 365. Office 365. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, these notes. Uh, so, uh, before I, I turn the podium over to uh, Simon, what I'd like to do is remind you that there are emergency exits uh, in the back uh, and on the side of the room. Uh, we will uh, be recording uh, the event 
Uh, and uh, during the, qu uh, the question and answer period, uh, we will ask you to raise your hand so you can get a microphone so we can get uh, your voice uh, asking the question uh, for the viewers uh, later on. So uh, what I would like to do then uh, is give, I, I'll talk to, did I get it all? I got it all. Okay, I'd like to give the podium over uh, to Simon Walker. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Bob. Um, I feel really sorry for all of you guys um, that Bob is retired and you never had the chance to take a class with him. He's definitely one of the, the best, one of the best that ever taught a class here, I'm sure. Um, never forget his States and Capitalism class. <laughs> it's excellent. Um, so, my name is Simon Walker. Um, I'm the president of Gen R, um, and I'm just going to kick things right off because we're short on time, um, and I have a lot to get through. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Gen R, and I'm also going to talk about the International Rescue Committee to give you guys an idea of why Gen R is important and what, what we do and why we support the IRC. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So yeah, we're going to cover an intro to the IRC, who are refugees, how does the IRC support newcomers in Washington State, how can we all help? And I'll uh, end it with telling you guys a little bit about Gen R. So the Inter International Rescue Committee was founded in 1933 after World War I um, at the behest of Albert Einstein, as a matter of fact. Um, Albert and a group of intellectuals saw, what, saw how people were being treated uh, around the world, that um, this was before the United Nations and the Declaration on Human Rights and all of the norms that we have today that dictate how we treat refugees. Um, so Albert and, and his friends saw a need to form a committee to advocate on behalf of refugees and try to get some of the rules changed so that um, they could be better taken care of. Today the IRC works in 40 countries nationwide, a little bit more than 40, um, and the IRC has 29 field offices in the United States. Um, all over the place, including here in Seattle and SeaTac. Uh, the headquarters for the IRC, the global headquarters, is in New York City. Um, and their advocacy headquarters, um, where they work with uh, the political establishment, is in DC for good reason. The IRC in Seattle opened in 1976. Um, they just moved their office to SeaTac. Um, the, the client population for the IRC is all in SeaTac, so it makes a lot more sense for it to be down there. Um, 25,000 refugees, probably a little more than that now, um, from more than 35 countries have been resettled to Washington State by the IRC um, since their opening in 76. And last year, the IRC resettled more than 650 individuals, um, primary here in South King County. Um, and they provide services to hundreds of additional um, refugees, special immigrant visa holders, um, asylees, and, and um, survivors of trafficking each year as well. Um, in fact, I didn't plan on saying this, but that reminds me, they also have, um, if you're interested in supporting um, survivors of trafficking, learning more about that, they have, um, the IRC runs the Washington uh, WARN program, the um, Washington Anti-Trafficking Network out of the IRC office as well. Um, so check that out on the website as well. So what is the definition of a refugee? It's a person that has a well-founded fear of persecution. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, there, there's there's a, a, a clear line delineating the difference between a refugee and an immigrant, and oftentimes it's hard for people to distinguish, um, or a migrant. Um, a refugee is someone that, that fears persecution for their life, for their political beliefs, or their, their um, religious affiliation, their ethnicity, um, here it is, nationality, social group. Um, this is, uh, being able to prove one of these types of persecution to an asylum officer is what allows people um, to gain asylum in countries under um, international law and under the laws of the countries that um, sponsor refugees. So this is a slide just to give you an idea of what um, the situation looks like today around the world. Um, 65.6 million people are forcibly displaced. That includes both refugees, people that have fled their country in fear of persecution, but also internally displaced people, people that have fled their homes in fear of persecution but have not yet exited the country but are still in serious danger. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, I looked this up this morning. 
65.6 million is somewhere in between the population of France and the United Kingdom. So it's an, a lot of people. It's a serious problem um, that the IRC is addressing all the time. And these are the top 10 nationalities that are resettled in the United States in, tw in 2017. This is just one of the examples of how they are addressing it. Um, so this just gives you an idea of where, where the, many of the, the top, um, top countries that have um, different uh, famines or conflicts or humanitarian crises um, are occurring and where they're going. Washington State, um, we resettled almost 4,000 refugees in 2017. Um, that's not just the IRC, that's all organizations that operate um, in Washington State from World Relief to um, UNICEF to many others that collaborate together to sponsor refugees for asylum. Here's a breakdown of w the, the ethnic groups and the national groups that um, come to Washington State. Um, this is an interesting point. So when the US, when the IRC's US programs decide on where people are gonna go when they're resettled in the US, they choose, um, they oftentimes will choose um, Washington State for, for, pop, for the Iraqi population, for Somalians, Afghan, Afghanistani, Ukrainian. Um, as you can see, because over the years since the IRC's founding, they have um, developed quite um, large uh, interconnected communities um, in South King County um, that help with integration. So big Somali community, big Iraqi community in South King County. So what happens when a refugee family arrives in Washington State? Number one thing is the IRC and sometimes GNR members as well will meet the family at the airport. Um, I think it's a great show of uh, welcoming. Um, oftentimes families come and all they've seen on their way here is what's on the news and what, how, how some Americans view how them and, and their culture. Um, so it's nice to, for the number one thing for us to do is, is to show up and say, hey, you're welcome here and we, you know, we wanna help you and you got people on your team. The IRC then sets families up in fully furnished apartments right away. Um, this is another powerful thing because oftentimes these people have been in camps um, for, for years, if not generations in some cases. So having your, you know, your first secure, safe home um, is a pretty powerful thing as well. Um, I'll just quickly go through these slides. Um, so they, um, this is after resettlement. They provide case management and social services. So healthcare screenings, meeting basic needs, like I said, housing, food, um, funding, social security cards, um, public assistance programs, et cetera. Doing job readiness and career training as well. Um, and that's one of the places that Gen R steps in. Um, LinkedIn training, interviewing training, so on and so forth. Things that we kind of take for granted, but I think um, understanding the interview and networking process in the United States um, is something that uh, doesn't come firsthand to a lot of people. It's different. Getting kids enrolled in schools. They do a great IRC summer school for refugee youth. Um, so yeah, and this is just this is just a tiny segment of of what they provide. There's there's too much to talk about. Um, so now I'll talk about Gen R. Um, Gen R is a group of young people all over the all over the United States um, here in Seattle and in eight other chapters um, that's focused on supporting the IRC through fundraising, advocacy work, um, doing things like I'm doing today, um, just kind of raising awareness about why the IRC is important. And um, yeah, everything under the sun. So since launching in New York City, Gen R, uh, in, in 2010, Gen R chapters have opened in the Bay, Los Angeles, Dallas, Salt Lake, Seattle, Charlottesville, and Miami. And I think there's a DC um, chapter soon to open as well. More than 350 active members across the nation. Um, that number's probably changed. I think that was last year's number. It's probably more than 600,000 that we've raised for um, the IRC. Um, so each, each office actually raises money for their particular, each, each chapter raises money for their particular office. Um, so that money is spread out all across the programs listed above. Um, Gen R Seattle was founded in 2014. 
about three years ago and has a little more than 60 members and an eight person leadership team. So yeah, we're from all over the world. Um, many of the members have worked or volunteered for the IRC before joining Gen R. Um, and a great, it, it represents a great networking opportunity as well. And you get a, um, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of exposure to different fields and careers. Um, we have folks that work at Amazon, the Gates Foundation, Microsoft, Path, big um, uh, health nonprofit, and lots of others. So some of the things that we do, I'll just run through this pretty quickly. Um, this year, we launched an annual sponsorship program where we have a committee within Gen R that their sole um, purpose in life is to approach corporations here in the Seattle area um, and develop relationships with the philanthropy departments, um, the departments that donate to, to nonprofits, um, and start building out a portfolio of companies that um, donate on an annual basis to, to Gen R on, um, that then gets put in the IRC's coffers here in Seattle. Um, so an example of this was um, we had a member approach her employer and um, she was able to start an internal uh, fundraising campaign within, within the company um, that resulted in a little more than $20,000 being raised by employees in, in that company for IRC. So doing things like that. Um, we support the IRC Seattle's Rebuilding Lives Dinner. It's a great event next year. It just ended. Um, it just finished this last October, um, early October. So mark your calendars for next October. Um, one of the things that takes up the most of our time is our flagship event, Flavors of the IRC. Um, Flavors happens every April. And it's, it's the biggest event that we put on per, um, in the calendar year. Last year, we had about 160 in attendance. Um, we had Pramila Jayapal speak. Um, Jay Ansley made a cool video. Um, and we were able to raise a little more than 50000 for the local office. Um, and basically, it's just a big party. Um, so it's, it's networking. It's to, you know, we have great, a great uh, keynote speaker that's a client that's been resettled by the, by the IRC. And they come up and tell their story, talk about why the IRC is important. Um, but it's great experience um, in, in building out events and you know, uh, getting your ducks in a row for, for a big gala like that. Um, and then advocacy and outreach. That's one of the big things that we do as well. Stuff like I'm doing today, um, social media campaigns. Um, we're building out our university engagement to be a little bit more formal, where we're going to have relationships with UW and SU and, and others to um, give them a chance to get involved with Gen R and volunteer and table and do things like that. Um, and then we do big networking events as well in the community. This is probably the coolest thing that we're doing right now. Um, we started a program this year called Career Connect, um, where we're extending the Gen R network out to IRC clients that have more white collar backgrounds. So there's a big problem with um, people being resettled that have professional backgrounds not being able to access um, job opportunities, even if they have the skill set and the experience to, to get involved whether it's a certification that's preventing them from doing it or a lack of a network or an understanding of how, what, what wheels you need to grease to get, get, get into that. So we've created a database of IRC clients that are looking for professional networking experience and resume help and interview help and so on um, and opened it up to Gen R members to create one-on-one -on -one, um, mentor relationships and connections with uh, clients. It's been pretty successful. Um, and then we also run LinkedIn workshops, resume workshops, and interviewing workshops, which I could probably use too sometimes, to be honest. All right, so these are some of the ways that you can help. Um, I, I, I can actually just send this, uh, this uh, PowerPoint to you if you, if, if you don't want to take all these notes. Um, maybe he can make it, a, it'll be available online. Okay, yeah, so these are some of the ways you can help. I think there's um, yellow business cards on that table. Um, that uh, have an email handle. Um, if you want to just send, shoot an email to that handle, um, seattlegenr at rescue.org, and just ask, hey, how can I get involved? Um, what's going on? What's coming up next? I can get you put on our uh, listserv and um, our newsletter and make sure you're made aware of all of it. Thank you. I think that's it. Any questions about anything? I might not be able to answer 
some of them because I don't actually work for the IRC. Um, so anything that's really technical about um, resettlement numbers from last year and things of that nature might might be a question I can look up and get back to you on. But um, go ahead. Um, how does like Gen R or the IRC help refugees who may have like mental disorders like autism or um, other kind of like childhood things that here a lot of people have access to when a lot of low income families or those who really don't know the services really don't have access to the sure. best? Mm -hmm. Well, Gen R doesn't do much help in that area, um, but the IRC itself in Seattle does have a full um, a full division dedicated to health and well-being and access to medical care. Um, so they do allocate a ton of resource, resources to one-on-one -on -one, um, one -on -one assistance and uh, making sure that clients have access to the, to the medical services they need, definitely. Um, yeah. Without the IRC, I think um, it's, it's really difficult for a lot of families to get resettled because um, if they're just simply on, um, if they're sponsored by the U.S. government to gain asylum, um, what they get is six months of a case manager that works with them. After that, six months is over, um, regardless of whether or not they have their apartment squared away, they have income, their kids are in school, they're in, enrolled in ESL, all the things that you need to do to integrate into a society, um, that, that um, assistance is totally cut off. So the IRC kind of picks up the picks up the slack in that area, including what you mentioned. Anybody else? Larry? Simon, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'll just get over to the mic. Could you clarify, is there an IRC office here in Seattle separate from the Gen R team? Yes. So, and what is the relationship between the two? Like right. Um, so the IRC office is in SeaTac. Um, it's a totally, it's, it's, I mean, it's not totally separate. Um, we do have a, a very professional relationship with the IRC, so I work um, on a weekly basis with the executive director and the development manager um, to, to build out these events and make sure that what we're doing aligns with their, their more broad goals and to make sure that we're supplementing their work properly. A lot of the times running a young professionals group like this that's a volunteer group, you can, you can step on toes, you can you know, build redundant volunteering ideas and spend a lot of time spinning things up like that. Um, so we, we work hand in hand with them to make sure that what we're doing aligns with the skill sets of Gen R members and what they're interested in doing and, and the needs of the IRC. Did I answer your question? Kind of. Yeah? Okay. So if somebody wants to work directly with refugees, supporting the refugees that mm -hmm. have been resettled here, they would probably go to, they'd volunteer with IRC and work through IRC. If they're interested in the advocacy and the fundraising, that kind of stuff that supports the work of IRC, that's where Gen R comes in? Yep. Okay. Outside of the Career Connect program that we have okay. and the LinkedIn workshops and stuff. There are some great opportunities for uh, college students with the IRC when it comes to youth mentoring pro programs. Um, I know that I would have liked when I first decided to go back to school for somebody that had kind of been through the ropes and understands getting enrolled in a place like Shoreline and what Shoreline has to offer to, or other community colleges for that matter, have to offer to, to come and talk to me. So it, that's, that's one place where you can get involved where you can do youth mentorship activities as well. So the, the question I have is more of a, um, a piece about you and how you connected to Gen R and why you did it and why you continue to do it. Well, um, I took a I think when I was awoken to the real plight of refugees, when I took a class at University of Washington, um, it was a, a senior seminar with about half the class graduate level students that all had worked in places like Dadaab in Kenya, one of the world's largest refugee camps for organizations like UNHCR and, and others. And um, I got a, a, a very clear picture of really what, what's at stake for these people. Um, 
after taking that class, it was one of my subject areas and areas of interest, and I put it on my LinkedIn that I was interested in IRC, and um, someone from IRC reached out to me when they were forming Gen R and said, hey, it looks like you'd be a great fit for the leadership team. We're launching this Gen R group here in Seattle, and um, I just jumped in. I said, you know, I like, I like opportunities like that to build things, and um, I jumped in, and here we are. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you might not know the answer to this question. Uh, you're saying that refugees are, you know, people that you know are fearing their life from prosecution. Do you get? I mean, what kind of messages do you get from the countries that these people are, you know, fleeing from? What do you like, mean by the message? Well, these people are fleeing from like governmental prosecution. Is that correct? They aren't. Are they all, are they? In some cases, in I mean, some cases, it varies. It's it, all over the place. But it, there, there's five, um, five pretty clear yeah. ways that you can prove that you have a well-founded fear for your life. Yeah. Um, for example, some of those ways, it can be government prosecution okay. by government. For or example, like religion. Yeah. Let's say someone is fleeing a country because they believe in a different set of ideals. What kind? Do you get? Does the IRC or the Gen R ever get messages from those from those countries because they're helping these refugees come in? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I'm sure that that, ex that happens quite a bit, but I don't think it's something that the IRC is really worried about. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea of what, what the IRC does before resettlement, um, they sponsor refugees from, from day one. So when, when a crisis or, or a conflict or a, a humanitarian crisis of any kind breaks out in any country around the world, the IRC has a team um, that is there within 72 hours is working with the UNHCR to facilitate protection of people. Um, so then, so they work to, to build refugee camps out and make sure that people have short-term protection right then and there. Um, after that, they work with prospective applicants for asylum. Um, less than 1% of refugees are actually resettled to a third country. Um, and the majority of people that fall under those um, categories that I mentioned and that can prove it um, are women and children, 70, 75%, some, something like that. So the IRC works with those families to build out a case um, and, and take, um, take everything down that, that has been documented so about why they're being persecuted or what has happened to them or their family members and get that into, uh, into a brief that, 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 that they then show to the UNHCR and at which point the UNHCR makes a decision on whether or not they uh, have a good chance of getting in front of a U.S. asylum officer and being sponsored for asylum and proving that they have that that well-founded fear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't. You know, it, it'd be look at something to look into. But I, you know, I'm sure that there are there are situations where the IRC is, you know, prevented from working in a particular conflict zone or you know has trouble. Um, gaining access to the to the funding and tools that they need in that country or what 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 have you um, because of because of what you mentioned but I think it's few and far between yeah. hi so with the conflict going on in Myanmar is the IRC there working with those people I believe they are, yeah. Um, they're, they um, actually, Burmese, uh, uh, over the last 30 years, have been one, the number one, one of the number one groups that has been resettled to Washington State. Um, I actually, one the, the head of finance at IRC is um, originally from Myanmar. He came as a refugee years ago. Um, but yeah, they do, they do in fact have a presence there. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you, that, that question triggers another one in my mind. And maybe I need a little bit more background on the IRC, but as I understand, the IRC has a presence uh, in several countries overseas. I think one of your maps showed it, mm -hmm. am I right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if people wanted to get involved um, with working with refugees overseas, they could do that. They could possibly There it is, actually. for IRC or somehow get a job working for IRC if they wanted to help Refugees that are being resettled in Washington State, they can help 
they could work, they would go to the RIC office in, in SeaTac. Absolutely, yeah. So learn your foreign languages if you, if you um, are interested in working for a group like IRC okay. um, abroad. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, um, there's options to work here. Go ahead. But no, I have another question. Because yeah. uh, we had another speaker here two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, Rita Zawida. She's the founder, president Salam. of... Salam Cultural. Uh, yeah, Salam, mm -hmm. SCM Medical Missions mm -hmm. in, yeah. in Syria. And she made a point that you, you, you kind of touched on too, that, that people, that Syrians, she focuses only on Syrians, that are resettled here often get very little assistance. They get maybe three months rent and then they're pretty much left on their own. Right. I, I gather that IRC does a little bit better than that? Absolutely, yeah. So the IRC's programs, um, once you become a client of the IRC, um, as, you, as you progress from getting your first house and m being met at the airport to getting your child in school to getting a job to getting enrolled in ESL, um, from beginning to end until you um, get US citizenship, the IRC is right there with you. And this can take years and years. A lot of their clients have been um, working with the IRC for for multiple years, um, and every year, um, another one for your calendar. Artficacy. It's a a big um, gala with refugee artwork um, for sale and for demons for um, for show. Um, is a great event where at the end they have their uh, IRC has their annual um, citizenship ceremony. So they actually have somebody from Department of Homeland Security there to to swear in a number of IRC clients that have um, been jumping through the hoops for years. So yeah. A little bit more than the U.S. government, what they do for for our sake. For, for. Okay, one more question. Sure. So the camps that are set up overseas, and if it's like the government that's harming these people, how is everybody kept safe? Yeah, a lot of the times the camps are actually um, put in place in a second country. So the the Somali, uh, the um, the Syrian crisis, most of the camps are in in Lebanon and Turkey and surrounding countries, Jordan. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's how they keep them protected in, in camps. So they just work with the governments of second countries, host countries that surround um, Syria, for example, is the best example right now. Um, works with the IRC to facilitate, and the UNHCR, the, the arm of the UN that, that, um, the, that deals with um, refugee issues, yeah, to facilitate protection. Anybody else? Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, again, just listening to the conversation here, uh, whether your group is dealing with some of the rise of the hyper-nationalism that's going on, uh, and particularly sort of the anti-immigrant and anti-refugee uh, that's happening uh, here uh, and in Europe uh, as well. So our, uh, are you interacting with some of those um, issues? Um, not so much in Seattle, um, just because of our political demographics here. Um, but there, you know, I mentioned there's a chapter in Dallas. Um, there's, you know, there's other, there's one in Charlottesville or Char, uh, yeah, Cameron, um, South Carolina. And those offices have um, not just Gen R, not just Gen R events, but um, IRC offices are constantly getting threats and there's very, even in our SeaTac office, there's very uh, high levels of security to get in and out of the building and so on um, for good reason because yeah, um, as you mentioned, the, the, dia the narrative around refugees has become pretty fear-based and caustic for them and for anybody that advocates on their behalf. Anybody else? Nope. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks for coming. Yes. Simon a hand. I am so impressed with the work your uh, group is doing and the work you're doing. It fills me with pride that I had any part to do with that at all. So whatever small piece, thank you so much for uh, coming back and sharing uh, with the group.